Okay, grand finale of CS208 today. Welcome one and all. It says on the boards, special extra office hours today starting at 4.30 in my office for folks with questions or want to talk about stuff with the proxy lab. Uh, I will be in Anderson in like the basement of Anderson teaching 111 until 4.30. So might not be there exactly on the dock, but come with questions. Uh, any questions about stuff besides the, the proxy lab? Uh, the final uh, should be available now on Gradescope. You should have received an email about being added to the CS208 Gradescope. That's gradescope.com. If you have uh, not received an email, if you have any problems accessing the final, please let me know immediately. The uh, rules of the final, as I've said, do 9 p.m. end of final, so that's 9 p.m. Wednesday. You cannot use late days on the final exam. Call it policy. I cannot accept any work after 9 p.m. Wednesday unless you apply for an extension through the Dean of Students office. Uh, the exam is open book, open notes, open computer, open any resource linked from the course webpage. It is closed anything else on the internet, which means don't just Google stuff, that's not allowed. And it's closed other people who are not me. So do not discuss uh, the exam with other people. The, uh, if you have questions of, or clarifications that you'd like about the exam, send me an email. Uh, and for any that are relevant, I will be posting Moodle announcements with any, any clarifications. Um, any any exam related questions? Michael. I don't know if you just said it. I just walked in. But can we like close the Moodle thing? Never. Like, no, I, I don't even know. I think about the new first time. Yeah, Gradescope will let you you like submit the exam to save your answers, but you can then resubmit any number of, of times. So submit is to save your answers, and then you can just resubmit to continue working or to, or to change an answer. Hey, did you change the answers you've already submitted? Yes, you can edit any part of the exam when you resubmit. Uh, and I'll just see whatever your latest submission was. Other questions? All right, a few things on the agenda today. I would like to do a bit of compare and contrast between C and Java. Uh, I'm going to put some of the things that we've learned in context, uh, and then I'll talk a little bit about kind of big things to take away from this class, take a bit of, of a victory lap, uh, and then we'll have time at the end to fill out some end of course surveys. So, as far as, wait, but before I get to that, how could I forget? There are birds. <laughs> Gotta do the birds. Okay, uh, here we have uh, a couple colorful Australian birds to end our, our bird journey together. Uh, the first is the uh, flame-billed Aracari, or Aracaris. Um, <laughs> I think it would be a lot more metal if the bills were actually on fire, but sadly they're just flame colored. Uh, but the, the main star is the scarlet macaw, uh, a colorful uh, uh, bird, and this is a tree nesting bird. So they'll nest in some kind of cavity inside a tree. They don't have a like woodpecker bill, so I'm sure that they are not hollowing out uh, this part of the tree, uh, but they'll kind of suddenly burst out of, out of the, the hole when they go to exit. Uh, and you may have seen this picture in my, in my office, <clears throat> one of a rare moment when the macaw is uh, perched halfway out of its, out of its nest. Uh, and just in general, very uh, colorful birds. And uh, all the pictures I have shown you this term uh, have been uh, courtesy of my parents who are really into birds. Uh, but I did see one 
uh, thing today that I thought was too too funny not to share. This is a uh, tufted titmouse, and it wants the raccoon's fur for its nest. And so it's just poking around and plucking fur off of this sleeping raccoon <laughs> because it makes good nesting material. It is just this is. This bird seems so annoying. Just, just leave me alone. I'm trying to sleep. All right, that's that's our birds. Uh, on to Java versus C. So there are a lot of things that are the same between Java and C. Uh, one is the syntax, which Java just took from C. Um, uh, you know, people know how to program in C. Let's also use curly braces and um, type names and everything that are that are similar to C. So our to our numeric types, ints, doubles, floats, uh, and longs, these have the same representation. So Java also uses two, two's complement for integers, also uses IEEE floating point for real numbers. So those are the same. Uh, in C, we call them pointers when we have the memory address of some value. In Java, we call them references, and having a different name is useful because there are a lot more restrictions on what you can do with a reference in Java than what you can do with a pointer in C. With pointer in C, we can tell the compiler to treat the memory at that address as any type of value we want. We can do arbitrary arithmetic with pointers to end up in a different memory address, all sorts of mischief. Uh, in Java, We have no pointer arithmetic. <coughs> if we cast values from one thing to another, it has to actually you know, be a, type, a, a subtype of whatever uh, you're casting. So uh, I, <coughs> I should have said at the top that uh, if you saw the announcement I sent out on, on Moodle uh, yesterday about uh, the terrible lies I've been telling about how fork could be used for the concurrent part of the lab. When we fork processes, they, they don't share memory, so they can't share a cache. And so the caching part just won't work. With fork, we have to use threads. And part of the code that I sent out for using threads, uh, cast. Uh, a long to a void star and then back to a long. The C compiler is, yeah, sure, I can do that. And John would be like, no, those aren't the same thing. You can't just convert from a number to some reference and then back to a number. So the Java compiler is going to uh, force us to, to write code that is, um, is a little more I guess regimented or, or clean or elegant or uh, constrictive if you're, if you're a fan of the freedom of C. Um, but, but Java compiler will do that. Uh, perhaps the, like the single biggest thing, uh, uh, difference about C and Java is that C, we go from C Translate it to assembly, which in that which then is what the CPU is actually executing. In Java's case, when we compile Java, it gets compiled into something called bytecode, a kind of binary uh, representation of the Java code. This is then interpreted by the JVM, the Java Virtual Environment, which is, so bytecode is like assembly for this other program, the Java Virtual Machine. And the Java Virtual Machine 
on an x86 computer is what is producing the assembly that the processor. So it's not like our CPU knows how to execute Java like code. So we still have to be sending uh, assembly to the CPU, but now we have this virtual machine in the middle, which uh, has several side effects. For example, the size of a long doesn't depend on the underlying system like it does in C, where on a 32-bit system a long would be 32 bits on a 64-bit system, 64 bits. The JVM just gets to define what a long is. And that means that in Java, a long is the same no matter where you're running this Java program. This also means Java programs have a portability that C programs don't, because the JVM is going to be the same on many different systems. If we compile Java on one system, it's the same bytecode running on the same JVM, whether this operating system underneath is Windows, Linux, Mac, whatever it is, we can just, just on the, the JVM, which is the same everywhere. Um, and we get some <coughs> security benefits because the JVM is in between what the program is doing and the instructions being sent to the system. So the JVM can sandbox or run the Java program in its kind of own protected space so that it can't kind of do the sort of mischief that a C program might be able to do. It doesn't mean that Java is free of security vulnerabilities. There have been plenty of those people have found over the year, but it does allow Java to provide security in a way that a C program has to just do itself. Questions on this so far? So, Another massive difference in Java is that it's object-oriented. We can actually define a class. C is not object-oriented. We can define structs and functions, but that's it. No actual like combining data and functions the way that a class allows you to do. And so uh, we have classes, we have inheritance, we have uh, object versions of our basic types. So Java, for example, has capital D double, the object version of uh, the 64-bit uh, the uh, floating point number. Uh, and oh, by the way, JVM implemented in C++. So that's, that's how that, so it's, it, it is down to C at you know, some point, as many things are. Uh, so one, speaking of security, uh, one, I mean, the security vulnerability that we looked at uh, this term was uh, the buffer overflow. And uh, this is simply not possible in Java, or at least not in the same way. Uh, because when it comes to arrays, Java does a few things that C does not. <coughs> it initializes the elements of an array, whereas in C we declare an array or we use malloc to allocate array. Though there's no initialization performed, um, some folks have run into to this on the lab. Because if you declare, uh, say, a, a character array, and then you don't initialize it, and then you like stir cat, you concatenate something with the character array you're assuming was empty, maybe it's not empty. If you need to depend on the character array being the empty string, you need to actually you know, like put a null terminator in the first character. Otherwise, the arbitrary bytes that are there might happen to correspond to some string, uh, and then weird things will happen. So, initializes elements, but 
The main secure thing with buffer, buffer overflows is It's going to keep track of the length of the array, how many elements are in this fixed length array, in an immutable field. So there's, uh, you can say, array.length in Java, and get the number of things in the array, and you can't modify that length at all. Once you create the array, the length is fixed, Access that a Java program makes to an array, the JVM checks is the index being accessed you know, between 0 and the length minus 1. And if it's not, it raises an array out of bounds exception. C, accessing an element array is just doing our pointer arithmetic and dereferencing. There's no checking of, of any kind. Any checking has to be performed manually by the program. And so if we are checking every array access, now a buffer overflow raises an exception rather than just continuing to write to potentially things like the return address. So is there any downside to what Java is doing here? Take some more time. Yeah, we have to actually you know, do some, some check on this, this length. Uh, there are some, are some mitigating factors or, or like, so it's going to take more than zero time. But anyone think of uh, ways that the system could make this check as fast as possible? Where should it keep this length if we want this check to be as fast as possible? Here you go. Yeah, it's absolutely going to be, I think, in practice is actually the beginning of the array. So a Java array would have like four as the length. And then if this was uh, uh, an array of characters, B, I, R, D. Do we need a null terminator to know when the end? No, because we have, we know there's four characters. We don't have to just happen to run into a byte that's zero to tell us how long the string is. Uh, so we, we have, the, that's right, we have the, the length next to our array in memory. Uh, is there somewhere other than memory that we could have the length that would be faster? Does that take? Obviously, like the register? Yeah, if we're, if particularly if we're in some loop over the array where we're checking the length every time we go around the array, we'll put it in a register. And so we still have to spend a, a cycle doing the comparison, but we don't have to do an entire memory access every time we want to check the length. So. Keep will almost certainly have the length in a, in a, in a in the cache, or better yet, in a register, uh, which will make computing it faster. Uh, it's also the case that the compiler might be able to determine that an access will never go outside the bounds, and so it won't even, it can compile away this check. So it, there's some function that takes in a number and that uh, uh, like loops over an array once for, for like that number of times, but then in the main method for that code, that number is just passed in as five. And so the compiler might be say, okay, every time this version of the code is run, always going to be five. Uh, and so don't actually need to check the bounds. That's the sort of thing that I'm 
talking about. Uh, so, just, uh, they're always over there. So just to emphasize this initialization point, if we declare a new array of four characters in Java, we get, running this in hex, we get initialize to, to zero. Uh, this is our Java array, our C array. We have four mystery bytes that could be anything. No one knows. All right, any questions on this stuff about arrays? All right, the last, uh, and so when it comes to the, the string objects, like in C, strings are gonna be arrays of characters underneath that we have an actual string class that has all sorts of uh, methods and so on, uh, but no null terminator and uh, they'll keep the, the length at the start. So, the last thing about Java is how do objects and structs match up as far as memory goes. So in C, we have some struct We have it has an integer, an array of three integers, and then a pointer to another struct. And if we looked at this in memory, we have our integer, our array of three integers, and then our pointer, which is pointing somewhere else. Like whatever this points to some other struct, some other region of memory. So we have four here, 12 here, eight there. Compare that to a Java class with the same fields. Um, and integer i and array that we allocate using new and and just a variable that's also of, of type rec. So it'd be more, more to it, like a constructor or, or other methods or what have you. But if we're looking at, at where this is, what this looks like in memory, we still have our field i, but this array is not within the same chunk of memory that the object is. What we have is a reference to the array somewhere else in memory, which would have the length and then uh, the three elements, and then P also pointing somewhere else. And uh, Whenever we call a method on our class, there is what's called a virtual method table or a vtable uh, that's in memory somewhere that the JVM uses to look up which method should be, should be called. Because if, uh, if we have different classes that are subclasses of each other, there might be different versions of the same method that would be called depending on what the actual type of the object is. And so that's why at the time the method is called, the JVM needs to look up, okay, for this specific object. It may, in the code, be declared as some super type, but actually the version of the method that should be called can look up in the table which one that is. Okay.
So does Java not have the internal fragmentation? Because like in C, if we had an int followed by two pointers, there'd be like the four bytes of internal fragmentation between the int and the pointer, but not in Java? Uh, I would actually, ex I mean, Java has to follow the same align, like the alignment is a property of the underlying system. Um, so yes, I think I do this just ignoring alignments um, for simplicity, but I think you're right that uh, there would need to be padding to align this pointer. Um, and yeah, there's, there's nothing that Java could do that would cause the underlying hardware to not be faster when memory was aligned, so it would want to align it. Do you know Java like checks if they're in the right order? Like if I declare to open Java, if I like it's already think to like like alternating, would it like switch it so that it's hmm. the number? Like you know if it actually does the checks? Or do uh, I don't know if Java will optimize the memory layout. Um, it's certainly more likely to than C is, because the philosophy of C is uh, the programmer is always right, even when they're definitely not. Um, so it's plausible that Java would do that, and Java was also created uh, many years after C, when the time that compilation would take and the memory use that compilation would take was not such a big concern. Like when you are in the 1970s, if you make a compiler that's trying to do lots of clever things, the compiler itself is too slow and uses too much memory. People have to wait too long for their code to compile. So you have the compiler not do, uh, kind of do as, as little as it can. Whereas Java created about like 15 years later, I could, and that compiler may, may have a different design philosophy about how much it can check. Other questions? All right, so if you're not familiar with the term victory lap, it is when the exhausted victors, that's us, take a uh, celebratory lap uh, around, around the track. So uh, one thing that uh, I want to uh, celebrate is skills from 208 that I hope you <coughs> carry forward after this class. And uh, I think that it's uh, highly unlikely that uh, the majority of you will uh, build a new operating system or a new compiler that just doesn't happen that often. Um, that's a pretty uh, niche task, but um, It's still useful to understand how the hardware is working, how the compiler is working, how the operating system is working. That will make you more effective at using those tools uh, or building things that interact with you know, a computer system in any way. Uh, another, and I think that the, the skills involved in, say, coding up uh, malloc and free apply to a lot of different tasks, even if the specific task of implementing malloc uh, only, only a few people will, will ever need to do in theory. So another thing to carry forward is the idea of translation. This is kind of a big theme running through the class uh, where we talk about translating C into assembly. Uh, we talk about translating uh, an integer into two's complement or a floating point number into the IEEE representation. Uh, when an assembly goes to the CPU, that's another translation of the text of the assembly into some raw uh, 
uh, bytes in terms of machine code, and it's kind of ideas of translation are everywhere in CS. Uh, and so that's something that I think you can, can carry forward from this, from this class. I would say debugging, something that uh, we've done quite, quite a lot of. Uh, use uh, both thinking about a systematic approach to debugging, I have, let's make visible to me, the programmer, the full state of whatever system I am implementing. Print out the, the heap after every allocation operation, or uh, as the proxy is reading a request or response, print out each thing that it, that it reads, each thing that it sends, uh, and this kind of systematic debugging by exposing what the system is doing rather than sort of arbitrary print statements just to track what line we're on uh, is, I think, an important, important skill to uh, take forward and as well as the skill of using a debugger like GDB uh, to set breakpoints, to examine variable values, to find the point of failures like segmentation faults. Something that has come up many times in this class is assessing the costs of some representation or design choice. So uh, whether that's two's complement versus sum of magnitude, or process-based concurrency versus thread-based concurrency, uh, a big theme running through is that when we're approaching something, thinking about the trade-off, the costs of certain choices is an important part of, of, of building any, any sort of software. And uh, the last thing I'll put on this list parts of this class as building our skill to kind of given some situation or problem where you don't have all the information or there's some new language or new tool that is involved kind of building the skill to kind of figure out how to use this or how to proceed uh, through reading documentation, through experiments, through kind of having the, I guess, the, the boldness to just start trying stuff and thinking carefully about what happens uh, when you do. So, another aspect to what we've done is that it has some uh, real world implications so uh, we've talked about uh, number conversion overflow leading to uh, expensive rockets exploding, uh, uh, not being careful about units uh, led to a, a famous disaster with a um, Mars climate uh, orbiter where uh, Part of the code was in uh, uh, metric and part was in imperial, and so the part of the code that was deciding when it should slow down for landing based on how far away it was from the ground, you can see how a mismatch assumptions in terms of how to interpret that distance could, could uh, damage a, a craft's ability to land. Uh, mentioned that there was, fortunately, did not occur in practice, but it was discovered that the Boeing, Boeing 787 had a potential uh, uh, overflow 
where if it had been powered continuously for 248 days, where it was just kind of uh, incrementing over time, um, if it hadn't lost power and, and reset during that time, it uh, would overflow and potentially result in the loss of all electrical power and the loss of control of the airplane. Uh, and this was because the original design did not think about, okay, what if this number overflows? Like what if uh, this just run, this program runs for 248 days without stopping, what might happen? Uh, and when you're doing something like writing software for an airplane, this has serious real world consequences, thinking about these sort of uh, extreme cases. Uh, something that, that did impact real people was uh, this was a few years ago now, but Toyota had uh, a big issue with unintended uh, acceleration events in some of their vehicles. And this actually went to court, and uh, the jury in Oklahoma hearing this case uh, uh, decided that the kind of spaghetti code, the like complete mess that was the software running on these vehicles, constituted reckless disregard for the safety of the passengers, uh, this code had more than 10,000 global variables. Uh, there's uh, a set of like uh, code quality standards, the uh, MRSA C coding rules. Uh, there were 80,000 violations of these rules in this uh, Toyota code. And you would expect three minor bugs and one major bug for every 30 such violations on average. Uh, and so this is a like complete train wreck of a C program, probably written by a combination of outside contractors with little to no like uh, um, like fine grained oversight of what this code and, and like if it worked, great. Let's you know put it in the cars, um, and that's just that. I mean. That's illegal, as the, the Oklahoma jury decided. <laughs> so this, this stuff matters in, in, in real life. And uh, because this stuff is so important, I think it's worth asking How can we improve computer systems? How can we think about different aspects of a computer system or a piece of software uh, that we might want to improve? So I'd like you to take a few minutes and discuss with your neighbors how, like, thoughts about different ways in which we might try and improve computer systems. All right. I'm very interested to hear your thoughts on how we might improve computer systems. It doesn't feel very realistic, but it would be interesting if you could, if there's some way to have, rather than all these discrete caches, or it's like cache one, cache two, cache three, and those are the number of caches you have, if there's some way to have like continuous caching, and it's just like continuous increments of distance from the CPU to memory. Yeah, more... more flexible hardware. Um, there's, uh, there is some, uh, some work on kind of hardware components that you can program. So like as part of running the program, the program can customize things about how the hardware works. Um, there are, uh, so sometimes this flexibility uh, takes the form of in probably Windows 95, um, but whatever version of Windows was
was being used when the game, Sim, the original game SimCity was released. Uh, this is a very popular game, and the game happened to use a particular behavior of some Windows system call that was not the official, it was just like a sort of accidental side effect. But this means that in future versions of Windows, when they fixed this or it changed, SimCity would break because it was using this undocumented behavior, this particular system call. So Windows actually had a line of code that was like, if the program running is SimCity, use this other version of the system call because it was important that customers didn't upgrade their Windows and then their favorite game just stopped working. Uh, so in some cases, flexibility can, can kind of cut, cut the other way. <laughs> hey. I say I think the most realistic thing to fix right now is internal and external fragmentation, or maybe a more efficient way to figure it out and save some memory. Yeah, efficiency is uh, uh, a huge place where we could make improvements. Uh, Aiden highlights uh, good thing about improving space efficiency, reducing fragmentation, uh, using less less memory. Uh, that's going to let our systems do more things or uh, allow programs to run on systems with, with fewer resources. Uh, John? It's obviously easier said than done, but like making smarter compilers that can catch errors like earlier and faster. Like I, in recent years, I've seen compilers that will highlight like this function may not return in all paths that it takes. And so like expanding that to cover more potential bugs. Yeah. As we've seen this term, the tools that we have available are important inputs to the computer systems or software that we get at. So having better tools, uh, including compilers, definitely, definitely important. Sam? Um, this doesn't quite go to the question, but updating perhaps like programs, it seems like the quality of computer systems often is a little faster than the quality of things that are on of those systems. Yeah, maintenance is a huge concern in the quality of computer systems. That uh, in my my SimCity story touches on this idea that uh, we have a, a bunch of old software uh, riddled with security problems, with uh, uh, outdated ways of, of doing things, and just the existence of all this currently in use and important software that was written decades ago poses a serious challenge for computer systems. Christian? Um, easier said than done, but better programmers? Yeah, so that's, I mean, that's what two is, is really about, I mean, all of you Better, better programmers, um, but yes, the the, the human element uh, can't can't take that out. What's that? Yeah, that if we want computer systems to be better, we can think about how can we make the people who make computer systems better at that task. Other thoughts? There are a few that I would uh, throw up here.
Reliability. Reliability. <laughs> Shock could, uh, could use that as well. Um, and there's a movement to uh, develop techniques for provably correct code. You basically have a, uh, a I mean, and this isn't possible with large programs yet, but with programs of, of moderate size, under certain conditions, you can have basically a, a uh, very specialized compiler that given uh, a specification of inputs and out outputs can prove that a piece of code is correct. Uh, and so this is being applied to things like software in airplanes, medical devices, um, uh, Instances where where security is of critical concern, uh, so making code more more reliable, and uh, that goes on with higher security and, and privacy. Transparency can be an important goal with computer systems. Um, a good example is uh, machine learning, where uh, you might train. Uh, a model to detect, uh, to be able to, to tell you, like, is the uh, mole or skin lesion in this picture cancerous or non-cancerous? Something that uh, a dermatologist would, or, or another medical profession would normally do. And uh, you train a model, and its performance is really good. But what you don't know is, what has the model actually learned? It's not transparent. Um, and so there are a lot of people now working on how do we kind of post facto explain what a machine learning model is doing. And in this partic particular example of skin cancer, they found by um, uh, using a t technique that indicated where in the image, like what pixels of the image the model was uh, using to do this cancer or non-cancer, that it was actually using the presence of a ruler to predict whether it was cancerous or not, because all the example data of cancerous moles were pictures from a dermatologist's office where they were measuring the size of the mole, so there was a ruler in the picture, and that is what the model learned, nothing to do with the skin. Uh, and so we only knew that because there was a technique to actually make this model transparent. Uh, and so particularly as computers get more involved um, in, in uh, life or death type things, having transparency in these systems can be, can be really important. All right, so I think uh, I'll leave it there. Uh, I have some uh, end of course surveys here. So each of these is two pages. Uh, uh, giving me some anonymous feedback uh, on what worked in the course, what didn't. Uh, so if I get uh, a volunteer uh, to bring these in this folder to me, once to wait until all of them have been filled out. Okay, thank you. So I'll be out in the hall. Please grab a survey. It's been great to wait this term. Thank you very much. Thanks, Eric.